Um, I spent Tuesday trying to get rid of all sorts of appendices from this too, so <laughs> I'll try to keep it to two hours. Um, about four years ago, Melissa Ryan and I were teaching classes that had some overlap, um, politics in the environment, she was teaching, and no, no, you were teaching literature in the environment, and I was teaching American politics, and we decided to teach one class session together to try to demonstrate some of the interdisciplinarity that we, uh, we could do with these topics. Um, so I was looking around for some readings, and this is what I came up with, Shadow Country, because uh, Matheson is an environmentalist and uh, has all sorts of really interesting political insights too. She came up with one that was about 860 pages shorter, so we decided to go with that one. <laughs> but ever since, I've been hooked on this book, reading it over and over and writing about it. So thanks to Melissa for the spur to get started in this and for all of our conversations about this stuff since then. And thanks to Emrys, who's threatened to read this book about five times for me and I think has made it four or five chapters in? Yeah, I finished it. You finished it? Well, then a special thanks to Emrys. One person who read this paper told me that they went out and read the book after um, the paper. So if any of you go, go do that, then I will count today as success. Let me say um, one other thing about terminology before I go on. I'll use later in the talk the word liberalism more than once. And um, is this good? Yes. Yeah. And uh, when I say the word liberal or liberalism, I'm not thinking in, in terms of uh, liberal and conservative the way we normally think of it in our political dialogue, our day-to-day -day dialogue. So I'm not thinking of... Um, Mitch McConnell and Harry Reid. I'm thinking of the way political theorists think of liberalism, which is the broader liberal tradition, which enc really encompasses all of our um, politics. So people like John Locke, Montesquieu, Thomas Jefferson, John Stuart Mill, ideas like separation of church and state, rule of law, rights, um, uh, and things like that. When I'm, so when you hear me say liberal, think in terms of those broader concepts. So what I want to talk about today is individualism, um, this concept that's pretty important in U.S. political thought, and especially the dominant form of individualism, which I'll call atomistic individualism. And I want to explore what it means and what the ramifications are, for, especially for the more dominant groups in, in our society, by looking at uh, Matheson's novel, Shadow Country, um, and especially his main character, E.J. Watson. I hope that I have time at the end to say a little bit about um, trying to replace the concept of atomistic individualism with something else as our primary understanding of what individualism should mean, something like democratic individualism. If I have time, I'll explain what that, that is, but based on practice sessions, I'm not sure I will. Um, as far as I know, the person who started using the word individualism is uh, Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. Um, many people that Tocqueville met had what he called sufficient education and fortune to satisfy their wants. They might not have been wealthy, but they had enough. And of them, he wrote, they owe nothing to any man, they expect nothing from any man. They acquire the habit of always considering themselves as standing alone and they are apt to imagine that their whole destiny is in their own hands. And that sounds like our rugged individualist. That, I think, in our culture sounds good, right? Good for that person. Um, notice, though, that Tocqueville says they imagine that, they, that their destiny is in their hands. And in fact, Tocqueville thought it was a problem. He said, when he continued in the next paragraph, thus, not only does democracy make every man forget his ancestors, but it hides his descendants and separates his contemporaries from him. It throws him back forever upon himself alone and threatens in the end to confine him entirely within the solitude of his heart. So, for, so Tocqueville was skeptical about the value of this individualism because he worried that overweening selfishness would dissolve the bonds of humans with each other. He thought aristocratic society held people together and he realized that that was going away and democracy was going to replace it, but he worried that the bonds between people were going to break as, uh, without anything to hold them together like the aristocratic society had. <laughs> 
But despite Tocqueville's worries, atomistic individualism uh, emerged as something that people in this country found um, quite appealing. Uh, you, you've heard of Emerson's self-reliance. This concept of being self-reliant uh, is so important to us. Um, although for Emerson it was more complicated, and if we get to the democratic individualism stuff, I'll, I'll explain what Emerson thought of when he meant self-reliance. But um, Jefferson also, the Jeffersonian concept of the, the yeoman farmer, the self-sufficient farmer just working out there on the land, growing their own food and not depending on anybody. Adam Smith's economics, laissez-faire, keep people off your back, just let people work in their own self-interest and they'll do fine and prosperity for whole society will, will, um, will rise. It will be the most prosperous as possible if we just let people do their own thing. And all of this is supposed to be propped up by property rights and um, individual rights protected by the government. And you can hear in there this concept of the American dream. That the American dream, um, which Jennifer Hochschild, this political scientist, has done a lot of work on, um, really can be boiled down to these four tenets, she says. That every individual, I should have put these in my notes, every individual can pursue success. That success can be reasonably expected. And that's really important. That the idea is that if you're working hard, you're going to be successful, right? And that's the third tenet. Hard work correlates with success, and success correlates with virtue. So if we look around and see successful people, what we're seeing are virtuous people. Right? People who've done well economically, they must be virtuous, hardworking people. That's the implication of the American dream. Um, but besides Tocqueville's criticism of atomistic individualism, there's another one that's out there, which says basically that it's just wrong. It just doesn't accurately describe how our society works. That we're not independent. We're interdependent, very interdependent, and we always have been. Even Jeffersonian yeoman farmers, they depended on the manufacturing taking place in Europe and the trade that would go back and forth to get the goods that they needed that they weren't making on their farm. Um, and much of that interdependence, this critique says, involves relationships of exploitation. Political theorist Jack Turner writes, since racial injustice advantages whites in American social and economic landscape, failure to relinquish or counteract that advantage is failure to be self-reliant on the terms of fairness and equality underwriting self-reliance. So in other words, if you get ahead because of another's work, that's not self-reliance. Right? You're relying on, on somebody else and in, in fact maybe exploiting them in order to get ahead. So the other thing about atomistic individualism is that it can mask that relationship of exploitation because it has a different explanation for inequality and that explanation is virtue. So if we think of the American dream again, the idea is that success demonstrates virtue. That means lack of success demonstrates lack of virtue, right? laziness, lack of talent, nobody, no work ethic. So when you see inequality, you can explain it either in terms of systematic issues causing this injustice, or if you're an American dream believer, you can explain it based on personal values or personal virtues. So I think that this critique of atomistic individualism is correct, but I'm not going to say much more about that today. I'd be happy to answer questions about it if you're interested. What I'm interested in today are the consequences of this masking of the benefits of atomistic in, uh, individualism for, um, for those who benefit in this society. Um, so basically for the beneficiaries of that masking. And here I'm heeding Toni Morrison's injunction to examine, quote, the impact of racism on those who perpetuate it. People like me who benefit from white privilege and ideologies of white supremacy, whether I want to or not. And that's really how, why this book hooked me, because I've been trying to work through a lot of these kinds of issues for myself, and reading this book over and over has helped me do that. So here's Jack Turner again, the political theorist. The racially privileged must learn salutary forms of self-distrust resistance to self-congratulatory self-conceptions and critical awareness of one's advantageous position within larger power structures. 
Novels like Shadow Country, I think, can help the racially privileged to resist self-congratulations. In fact, I think that those of us who are racially privileged do great damage to ourselves when we accept that privilege, and that's what I want to explore today. The main character in Shadow Country is this guy, E.J. Watson. Um, he's a, a plant, E.J. Watson was a historical figure. He actually lived, um, I'll say a little bit more about him later. He became a noted plantation owner um, and a perennially budding entrepreneur, always on the verge of making it big, never quite making it big. Uh, at the turn of the century, in the uh, 10,000 Islands area of the west coast of Florida, his innovations in farming were uh, numerous. He did things like he figured out that if you, if you burn the cane sugar, he grew sugar cane, and if you burn the cane, it makes it easier to harvest. And so he was one of the first to do that, or the first to do that, and that spread. He also figured out that by just selling cane sugar, he, he was subject to the whims of the market. So what he did was he started boiling it down to cane syrup, which lasts. And then he would just store that until the market value for the cane syrup was what he wanted, and then he would sell it. So he was a clever, uh, innovative guy, hardworking guy, ambitious guy, perfect embodiment of the American dream. However, Watson also tried to use race to hide from himself his exploitation of others, although he can't quite fool himself completely for his whole life. So I think if we follow his life, we see the damage the self-delusion of atomistic individualism can wreak. This is Peter Matheson. I'll just tell you a little bit about him. Um, he, he was 86 when he died. He died just last April. Uh, he's, he was a remarkably productive writer, novelist, and he also wrote a lot of nonfiction. I heard that he might have been here in the 70s after Snow Leopard. This is a, his nonfiction book about a trek that he took in the Himalayas after his wife died. It won the National Book Award. Um, he also wrote At Play in the Fields of the Lord and Far Tortuga, two other novels. And in the late 70s, he started this novel, um, which is now Shadow Country. He wrote 1,500 pages and took it to his publisher. And the publisher said, no, too long. You can't do that. But it's in three parts, so why not break it up? Make it three different books. So he spent another uh, number of years editing it into three different books, and those came out over the course of a, a five or six years, Killing Mr. Watson, Lost Man's River, and Bone by Bone, and they received critical acclaim. But Matheson wasn't satisfied. And so all you first-year students out there, remember this. He still wasn't satisfied. For him, it was one book. And so he decided he'd revise it again. So he did that for the next six or seven years. So 30 years after he started writing it, he came out with Shadow Country. And that won another National Book Award. The story, I'll tell you a little bit about the story of E.J. Watson and then go back and focus on one particular uh, scene. Uh, so this is where he lived. This is where he ended up. This is the southern, uh, west, southwest coast of Florida. Up in red there is Chukalusky. That's an island. If you've read the book, that'll sound familiar because a lot of this stuff takes place in or around Chukalusky. There's an aerial view of Chukalusky today. And see there at the bottom, Smallwood's store. That's Ted Smallwood's store. Again, for the two of you who've read the book, um, you'll know Smallwood's store. That's where the first scene of the novel takes place. And there's Smallwood's store, which I think still stands. I have to say, I, I've never been there. I, I grew up in California, and I've never really uh, had a great desire to go to Florida. Um, but that changed when I read this book. So now I'd love to see the 10,000 Islands area, but I've never been there. So all these pictures, uh, pictures are just from the web to give you a sense of where he was living. So I'll go through this kind of quickly, but here, here's an aerial view. From Chuck Kaleski, he, he would go up this river, Chatham River, to Chatham Bend, which is where he established his plantation. That's the kind of scenery he would see going by. There's a little up-close version. And that's, that's the plantation itself, and you can see the discoloration. You can see how much he cleared. And this is brutal country. This is mangroves and really dense um, mosquito-infested, alligator-infested area. 
so it's, it's pretty amazing what they did. Not he, they, and that's an important part of the story. But you can see the discoloration there, which is, which is all the land that he had cleared for his plantation. There's a little bit closer view. That's what you'd see going up Chatham River towards Chatham Bend. And there it is now. You can camp there if you'd want. Although if you've read the novel, you probably won't want to. Um, but that's the Watson place. And that's looking out from the Watson place. That's the house that he built. So that would have been right there next to the dock almost. Um, it was the biggest house in the area for quite a long time, but it finally burned down, so it's not there anymore. And I mentioned that he boiled cane sugar down into syrup, and this is where he did it. And this apparently still is there, his, his boiling pits, um, where he turned that stuff into things that he could, into a commodity, basically. Okay, but that's getting ahead of the story. So let's go back to when he's a boy. This would be uh, a, a, a plantation in South Carolina, which is where he was born and grew up. Um, and like I think I said that he was born just before the Civil War. He developed two reputations. I've mentioned one already, that of the successful planter. Uh, but the other one was as an outlaw. And over the course of his life, he was accused of a number of murders. And one of the intrigue, intriguing things in the novel is, is trying to figure out whether he did them or not. Um, and Matheson imagines in this book how those two sides of Watson fit together um, and maybe are even in, uh, dependent upon one another. So he grew up in a landed family. The Watson family had uh, large plantations in the South Carolina county. His father, though, had lost his share of the land. Um, and he returns from the Civil War a drunk and abusive father. During the Civil War, Watson worked on his uncle Tillman Watson's plantation. And there he became very close with one of the slaves, a young man named Joseph. Uh, I'm going to play a clip of a pivotal moment in, in young Watson's life. If this works. When the war was nearly at an end and many slaves were escaping toward the north, a runaway was slain by overseer Zebediah Claxton on Tillman Watson's plantation at Clouds Creek. Word had passed the day before that Doc and Joseph were missing. At the racketing echo of shots from the creek bottoms, yelping in fear for Joseph, I dropped my hoe and lit out across the furrows toward the wood edge, trailing the moaning of the hounds down into swamp shadows and along wet black mud margins, dragged at by thorns and tentacles of old and evil trees. I saw Doc first. Dull, stubborn Doc lashed to a tree. Then the overseer whipping back his hounds. Then two of my great uncles, tall and raw-boned on raw-boned black horses. Behind the boots and milling beasts. The heavy hoof stamp and bit jangle. A lumped thing in earth-colored homespun sprawled awkwardly among the roots and ferns. The broken shoes, the legs hard-twisted in the bloody pants. The queer gray thing sticking out askew from beneath the chest. How could that gray thing be the warm and limber hand that had offered nuts or berries, caught my mistossed balls, set young Master Edgar on his feet after a fall? All in a bunch, the fingers had contracted like the toes of a stunned bird, closing on nothing. On long-gone Sabbath mornings of those years before the war, I ran with the black children to our games in the bare earth yards back of the quarters, scattering dusty pigs and scraggy roosters. In cramped, fetid cabins, I was hugged with all the rest and fed molasses biscuits, fatback hominy, wild greens. And always, it seemed, this sweet-voiced Joseph made the white child welcome. Yes, Joseph was guilty and our laws were strict. Alive, he would be cruelly flogged by Overseer Claxton, just as Doc would be tomorrow. Yet, in my fear, I wept for poor gentle Joseph, and pitied myself, too, in this loss greater than I knew. That loss greater than he knew is an important line. <laughs> 
Joseph, I argue, plays a paternal role in Watson's life, offering an alternative model of fatherhood to Elijah Watson's who was to, uh, a model, who was Edgar Watson's birth father. I'm just going to put all those up there. Um, in Elijah, his, his birth father, he felt pride, or he wanted to feel pride, and that's what his birth father wanted from him. Um, by the time he was a little bit older, he couldn't feel that either, but that was the goal. But for Joseph, the feeling was affection. And where he always sought to please his father, even when he didn't like him anymore, um, he sought to just enjoy Joseph, just to be with him. He can't connect with his father, his birth father. He always connected with Joseph. And by the time he's a teenager, he wants to kill his birth father. Um, but as you'll see in the next scene, uh, he wants to protect Joseph. And then there's the very important difference that Elijah is white and Joseph is black. So as we just heard, Joseph was killed by the overseer Claxton while trying to escape. Watson is young when he comes across the scene of Joseph's death and the Watson family patriarchs side with the murderous overseer, Claxton. Watson must choose between the life that his birth father's family represents and the one that Joseph represents. And we hear that choice in this next scene. Uh, Claxton is now riding away. He's taking Doc, the slave who survived the shooting, back to the plantation um, and leaving Joseph out in the woods. In dread of swamps and labyrinths, of dusk, of death, the shadow places, I called after the overseer, my voice gone shrill. You fixing to leave him out here? Out in the dark swamp all night by himself, with the owls and varmints? That's what I meant. The man snorted because he dared not curse a Watson, even a Watson as young and poor as me. Niggles will come fetch him or they won't, his voice came back. In the dusk. The forest gathered and drew close. I stood transfixed. In its great loneliness, the body lay in wait. I wanted to go close his eyes, but alone with the corpse at nightfall, I was too frightened. Already that shining face with its stopped blood had thickened like a mask, and bloodied humus crusted its smooth cheek. At last I ran and knelt by Joseph's side, tried to pull him straight, free his gray hand, fold the arms across the chest. The dead are heavy, as I learned that day, and bulky, too. He would not lie the way I wanted. I stared at him frantic, out of breath. The forehead, drained, resembled the cool and heavy skin of a huge toadstool. The brown eyes, wide in the alarm of dying, were dull, glazed, dry. Trying to draw the eyelids down, my finger flinched. So startled was it by how delicate these lids were, and how naturally they closed, as if he were drifting into sleep. But also by the hardness of those orbs beneath their petals. Who could have imagined that the human eye would be so hard? When one lid rose a little, slowly, in a kind of squint, I jumped and fled. So consciously or not, Edgar is making a choice between the world he knew with Joseph and the world of his father as Claxton imposed it. Joseph appears to Edgar as neither black nor white, transcending the racial distinctions. The queer gray thing sticking out askew from beneath the chest is Joseph's hand. And Edgar wants to treat Joseph with the dignity of a free person, of an equal, to pull him straight, free his gray hand. But he finds it impossible to liberate this hand that transcends the color line. Finally, Edgar flees back to Claxton. So choosing Joseph turns out to be too hard. Edgar discovers how heavy and bulky the dead are, and Joseph isn't the only dead Edgar is dealing with here. Edgar wrestles with the norms passed down by generations of his forebears, heavy and bulky norms that make Edgar's affection for Joseph a transgression. The overseer, Claxton, is the immediate agent of these social pressures, but flouting Claxton is equivalent to abandoning family and position. In the end, fear sends Edgar back to Claxton and the security of his proper role as a young white boy. <laughs> 
So choosing the birth family includes uh, choosing a host of other things. For example, uh, choosing property as a source of comfort. Here's what his uncle teaches him about property. Sir, what is it that constitutes character, popularity, and power in the United States? Sir, it is property, and that only. And that's a quote from Governor Hammond of South Carolina, which is a favorite in the Watson House. And he's also learning or choosing ownership as a model of human relations, relationships. Wives, kids, laborers, black people are all subject to Watson's ownership. But that model denies him the chance to experience the fulfillment of reciprocal relationships. Uh, choosing Claxton and his white life, he avoids the scorn that loving a black person would bring upon him, keeping his reputation. And the slain initiates Watson into the racial hierarchy that governs the South. Although shocked by Claxton's refusal to see the humanity in Joseph and bereft over Joseph's slaying, Edgar's actions implicates him in the racial hierarchy that justifies violence and protects its perpetrators. Joseph's body is left behind, ceding all shape and semblance to the dark, while Claxton, Edgar says, I knew would be laid to rest in higher ground, in sunny grasses, in the light of heaven. All that privilege. Claxton is not the only beneficiary, though. His brutality maintains the position of Edgar's great uncles, and through them, of Edgar, too. Partaking of the benefits of his whiteness entails taking responsibility for viol the violence of Claxton, for that violence maintains the socioeconomic system that provides the benefits. Further, that violence maintains the ideology of white superiority that binds whites together, even whites who do not enjoy as many material benefits of the system, whites like Claxton or Edgar's father. Inchoately, Edgar understands that his position in this racial hierarchy, simply a consequence of his color, privileges him. His privilege comes at a cost, though. As Edgar intimates, his loss runs deeper than the death of his friend. He has also lost his capacity to experience human relationships as fully as he did with Joseph. And you might remember that last line of that piece we just uh, heard, that Joseph's squinting eye is what sent uh, Edgar fleeing. And Joseph's squinting eye remains with Edgar his whole life, forcing him to see black Americans and forcing him to see himself for what he is whenever he treats other humans as Claxton treated Joseph as a means to advancement. Watson is so torn by this decision that an alter ego forms inside him, Jack. Watson calls this alter ego his shadow brother, hinting that his shadow brother is Jack. It, sorry, is black, he is Jack. Um, and I'll say more about that later, but I'm gonna hold that thought for a minute. So Watson's made his choice, but now he's in a trap. He seeks the fulfillment of human relationships, but he looks for them in the securing of property, in the achievement of success. His Watson birth family taught him to seek fulfillment through property, so that is what he tries to do. But to achieve that property, he must reenact the exploitation of Joseph. Each time he does that, he grows more ashamed and more easily angered, and that temper gets him in trouble, and he has to leave wherever he is and start anew. When he goes somewhere new, he works even harder to become, uh, um, excuse me, he works even harder and becomes a little more willing to exploit. But that drives him further away from what he really seeks, the fulfilling human relationships. And he must reenact that exploitation because that's how you develop capital in our system, by working the labor and benefiting from that labor. So the harder he tries, the further away he gets from what he's trying to achieve. And that will be the pattern for the rest of his life. At different times, Watson incriminates his black friend Frank by tossing his gun in Frank's field in order to make his escape. He brutalizes a black prostitute to help himself overcome the loss of his first wife. And he becomes known for Watson payday on his plantation in Chatham Bend, 
Watson Patey refers to his reputation for killing rather than paying his help at the end of the cane picking season. He just can't get past that willingness to exploit others based on race that atomistic individualism has long encouraged in whites. In this scene, he reasons that brown lives are worth trading off for the success that he wants to offer his family. The woman he mentions in this scene is Mandy, his second wife, and the only real moral compass left for him by the time he's, he's saying these words. When the war was nearly at an end and many slaves were escaping toward the north. Sorry about that, wrong one. What I'd done must have been wrong by my own lights because I'd hated the doing of it and still felt sick to death. No matter how often I insisted to myself that my business and my family's future and my great plan for developing this southwest coast were simply more important than the loss of two anonymous brown lives which were, by comparison, inconsequential. Sad but true, as even Mandy would agree. Well, would she agree? You're not sure, Mr. Watson? Only at the end of his life can he answer that, that question. And I'm going to play his answer now. taking a human life one paid with one's own soul to extinguish the light in another's eyes was the death of self those eyes reflected forever in your own would never close the there's joseph eyes joseph's eye again it won't close just keep squinting at him You might remember that I mentioned a little earlier that Watson developed an alter ego, Jack Watson, at the time of Joseph's death. As I said, Edgar Watson called Jack Watson his shadow brother, hinting at his blackness. At first, the shadow brother was a friend who could take Joseph's place. But as Edgar Watson ages, he projects more and more of his shame and anger onto Jack, who becomes increasingly violent. Edgar Watson is the charming, hardworking Southern gentleman. When he is ashamed or angry, though, Jack Watson appears, as if out of a bubble. And he is the Watson to intimidate or harm others. Edgar Watson needs this side of himself to exploit people. But rather than take responsibility for that, he projects this ugly side onto Jack. And there's a really interesting book called uh, Wages of Whiteness. Uh, by David Rudiger, where he talks about this same idea, and he has a chapter on minstrelsy and minstrel shows, and the idea that when white people were dressing up in blackface and then portraying black people as they perceive them, they're simply projecting their own uh, fears or desires onto other people, but projecting things that they don't want to reveal about themselves. We can trace Watson's psychological deterioration through the steady emergence of this alter ego, which comes out in the way he refers to himself, his name for himself. When he's born, he's born Edgar Artemis Watson, even though I've been calling him EJ, which is how he died. He was born Edgar A. Watson. But when he fled his first home and went south to Florida, he changes his uh, middle initial from A to J. He wants to renounce his, his father's family. So there he's Edgar A. Watson. When he moves to Florida, he becomes Edgar J. Watson. When things go badly there and he moves to Oklahoma, he starts going by Edgar Jack Watson, and Jack is appearing more and more frequently now he'll pop out and uh, be the violent Watson more and more frequently. So that by the time Edgar Watson moves to Florida, he changes his name to Jack. He's still E.J. Watson, but the, the first name he goes by is Jack. <laughs> 
I'm going to play a scene late in the book when Watson finally sort of reconciles or figures out what's going on with Jack. about my shadow brother? The truth about my shadow brother? Jack Watson never showed up anymore because we two had become one. Probably we were never different. Now I know that. So Watson finally accepts the oneness of his white and black selves but it's too late for him to put those selves together in the name of developing, fulfilling human relationships. That's not what I wanted. Sorry about that. So, as we close the book on Watson, we see an answer to Toni Morrison's question of what the impact of racism is on those who perpetuate it. While one's self-interest, narrowly defined, may benefit from the exploitation of another, one's self is damaged in the process. Denying that interdependence offers a shallow form of freedom since it appears to liberate one from obligations. At a deeper level, though, it also isolates one from sustaining human relationships. And what I want to suggest is that thinking of atomistic individualism as an organizing concept of society, as the model of individuals in a liberal society, does great damage not only to those who are exploited by our political and economic system, but by those who ostensibly benefit from that exploitation. And that we should replace atomistic individualism as our aspiration with democratic individualism, giving ourselves a chance to develop closer connections to other humans than to property. I think I'll skip democratic individualism. If people want to ask about it, I'd be happy to say more, but I don't want to, I want to leave at least a minute or two for questions. So I'll just wrap up. Ultimately, the tradition, the liberal tradition of individualism should not be read as individuals doing things by themselves for themselves. Rather, the liberal tradition of individualism should be seen as the imperative for society to create conditions amenable to the fullest development of individuals possible. In Liberalism and Social Action, John Dewey distills the liberal tradition to these three goals, liberty, development of the inherent capacities of individuals made possible through liberty, and the central role of free intelligence in inquiry, discussion, and expression. Some people worry that by focusing more on equality, we diminish our emphasis on personal responsibility. But again, I think this misses the point that we are not ever personally responsible for our situations, not wholly so, whether we're successful or not. We are interdependent. What we can be personally responsible for is contributing to conditions that allow everyone to develop themselves as fully as possible. Thank you.